What's up, everybody? It is the Ring Queen, Lexa Rose, and you are watching the Three Cow Podcast. I'm in fashion. Welcome, everybody, to another great edition of the Three Cow Podcast presents Now Entering the Ring, and I'm your host, Clifford Red Dog Miller. That's right, the man that leads you up this mountain called wrestling. But like every good Sherpa, which by now I would hope that you're finally calling me that person, you got to have someone who's been there, done that, and can do it more efficiently than you can. That's why it's never about me. It's about who's entering. And who's entering the ring today? Well, she can be found at WWO, SWA, PPW, and WBW. She is the ring queen, Lexa Rose. What's up? What's up? I'm so glad to be here. Really excited today. Me too. Um, <laughs> I, I love I love doing podcasts. You don't understand. Like it's so much fun to just kind of be able to still be a wrestler, but not have to do any of the physical stuff that goes along with it. So I do love it. <laughs> yes, and I definitely like this is like my favorite part about doing like anything that has to do with wrestling is doing the podcast because like. Um, yeah, like you said, you're not taking bumps, you're not getting beat up, you know, you're not taking accidental punches to the face, you know, it's just, it's just a conversation that you get to have with somebody. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, full transparency, I remember like I was asking like a lot of questions and people were bringing up your name and stuff. So I was like, let me reach out to this person. And I just want to ask, who is Lexa Rose? Uh, well, former ring queen, I guess you could say. Um cowboy queen uh the voice of swa or as i like to call myself the royalty of wrestling because i'm oh i always got the hot tea ready for everybody um being the creative director of TikTok, you know which is a pretty big you know deal for someone like me to be given the responsibility of being in charge of like marketing and media for a company's social media site um and at first it was kind of scary, but then, you know, I just realized to treat it a little bit more delicately than I treat my own TikTok because my own TikTok, I pretty much no holds bar. I do whatever. But for this one, it centers around our company, SWA, which I've been with for so many years. Um, I owe my life and career to it. So the fact that they still keep me around as a ring announcer is probably like a blessing because... Um, I didn't expect to be welcomed with such open arms by the SWA fans. And, you know, the last couple of shows we've either sold out or were like almost sold out. Like we had to like add additional chairs because we ended up having so many people. So it feels pretty good to still be in the wrestling business in one way, shape or form. It's interesting because you brought up something that I don't think like we've talked about enough like on the show. And I kind of, I've always thought about this show as like being like a college course, right? Um, and I keep harboring on that because I've had people like kind of mention it to me that way. But it's something that people don't talk about enough is the marketing side of like wrestling, right? Because like what people do is they think about like, oh, well, you're a pro wrestler. You just kind of like just show up and like beat people up. And what people don't know behind the scenes is that essentially you're the business, right? Like you're in charge of all your bookings, you're in charge of marketing, you're in charge of, uh, you know, built networking, you're in charge of like your look, your, how you're perceived, your music, like everything that goes on the side. So it's like, you're kind of like a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, enterprise without the multi-billion part. Like <laughs> your dollars, handshakes, you know, hot dogs, like those are the things that you can expect, but yeah. not like, not an abundance so it's kind of interesting to hear someone talk about the marketing side of things i'm kind of curious like with the marketing side like how have you been building up uh, swa on tiktok as well uh to continue to grow your uh grow, grow the brand brand as well as your own well for me um i like to kind of do it with like give very little but yet still tell the story so a lot of the stuff that you'll see posted on SWA's TikTok is always um, literally promos that are kind of clipped up and then you don't really hear the context of it. It's just put up there with no context to kind of 
lure and bait the fans in because once they see the clip they're like wait what's going on what is this about i don't hear anything all i see is music or some sound clips and stuff now i want to know what's going on so then people visit the site or they visit the um facebook page and all the other social medias to find out what's going on and then you know it it kind of helps tell the story a little bit um and kind of just kind of what I do is I basically like bait everybody. I dangle the little bait and I'm like, here's a little, you know, something, something that I discovered some tea in the backstage area. And then people want to know what it is. So then eventually they follow SWA and then they get the whole like part of the story, almost kind of like when Marvel comes out with their TV shows, like you had WandaVision, you had Loki and each one of those kind of built up to the multiverse of madness so that's pretty much what my TikToks are. They're like the little Disney Plus shows in between the major films that are pretty much the SWA shows. I, I like that comparison because, like, uh, a lot of people obviously obviously love like Marvel or DC or even like Star Wars or something, but they all get that reference of like, hey, you want to give like the sneak peeks, like the even like the trailer right like you get the teaser before the trailer before the movie <laughs> so i like the aspect of breaking things down from like the full feature film to like obviously like to the short clips and i love that aspect that you talk about like doing little clips and draw the people in uh, and i think that's i think that's a very clever way of doing it uh how many posts would you normally put up a day for swa or even for yourself like your tiktok um for swa i usually kind of go by what the El Jefe um, does uh, what he says. Usually, like, right after the show, he'll give me, like, a week or two to edit the videos and then post them up. And then what I do is I usually share them. Like, I'll repost them um, during the week to try and promote ticket sales. And sometimes I'll just go on my own personal TikTok because I have 16K followers on there. And I try to like send them over to SWA, like I'll do duets with them or I'll just take some of the SWA clips and put them on my Instagram just to pretty much like drive traffic over to them using my following. And when it gets closer to showtime, what I do is I take like some of the best parts of all the matches from the show before and I try not to give too much away because you don't want to give out the whole entire match because then people aren't going to want to come. They'll just wait until months down the road and I don't want to do that. So what I'll do is I'll put like little teaser clips of, you know, what you missed, what you got, you know, what to look forward to with the next show. You know, here's the story thus far. Kind of, um, you know, like a, a perfect example because I just actually finished the, um, the show where they begin like every episode with like previously on Legends of Tomorrow. And then you'll have like a whole recap of what happened. <laughs> so that's what I usually wait till like it gets close to showtime. And then like once a week I'll post up, you know, previews of one match that occurred, previews of another match. And it's always like literally within the 60 minute range so that I'm not giving out the whole entire match, but people see, oh, wow, this actually looked like it was a really good match. Maybe I want to catch up to, uh, catch up with watching it on YouTube and stuff. So yeah. I feel like, and, and that's the thing too, like to like grow an audience, like on it's all, any social media platform, like you have to treat it like a full-time job yeah. and it is very hard, especially when you're, you have all like the other distractions that are going on. Like even for me, like I have this show and like, I don't get the chance to go through and clip out funny things that happen so that people could see like what's going to be coming up. And so, so it's me just kind of like having to tell people like, no, you got to really just trust me and check out this episode. But it does also, it, it does definitely help when you have clips of the shows that you, you did and just put them in so people can just like see them and like, then hopefully it draws like more interest into like whatever you're trying to get into, get them into. Yeah. I mean, it is exhausting to a fault because um, I, I'm not just editing videos for SWA. I'm also editing for my own YouTube channels and stuff. So it's, it's, I kind of like try not to stretch myself too thin when it comes to creating content. Um, I just started getting back into it. Cause even though I have like, you know, my shoot job 
uh, the hours are great enough and the, the, the schedule is great enough where I have like an actual weekday to just kind of catch up on everything, catch up on editing videos and not being distracted by my husband who's like often gaming and stuff. Um, it, a lot of my fans who follow me on YouTube will hear him in the background. It's something that's been going on for all the years that I've been filming my Wrestling With Beauty series. But um, it sometimes helps to have like a Friday where he's at work and I can film freely without any like additional noise in the background. So, um, but now that I'm, I'm kind of getting back into the rhythm of things, you know, there's more content. I just finished filming like oh, a whole bunch of videos, unboxings. Uh, I have some makeup tutorials coming up. I just finished my Dan Housen one, which is going to be going up in a couple of weeks. So yeah, just coming up with makeup ideas and unboxings and product reviews and stuff and also editing for SWA and making sure that I make the videos, you know, funny, eye-catching, you know, something that people can actually engage with and stuff. Um, it's tiring, but it's rewarding. Like I, I like the final result because I do put a lot of time and love into making all of these you know, preview clips for the SWA TikTok. So um, for me personally, it, it's rewarding. Yeah, my TikTok channel is like all over the place and I'm going to front like, there's like some wrestling stuff in there and then there's like a whole bunch of like comic book stuff. It's pretty much like a mishmash of just me and like whatever I want to talk about and just do and post up or duet or even just stitch. So I never really have a, a direct path. I'm always just kind of like, hey, this is me. Either you're going to join up with me or you're not. And then, like, sometimes I'll throw, like, wrestling clips in there, like, my matches and stuff. So, yeah, it's yeah. just, it's a little bit of, like, everything. <laughs> no, the same thing with mine, too. Like, it, it'll go from comedy to makeup review, product review, wrestling. Um, one of my favorite things I like doing is, you know, the filters that have, like, the randomly changing pictures and stuff? Like, I usually do what I call the battle royale. So, if there, there was one where they had a uh, total drama island so i did the total drama island battle royal and i you know named the 30th entrant the first entrant the forbidden door entrant and a lot of people get a kick out of those which is you know fun so i, I like doing those um sometimes i'll just like do videos where i'm just in like a full face of you know like either like this recently i just did the dan Housen one before that i had done the fiend um and then prior to that, I've done, like, so many, like, I do, like, inspired makeup that's inspired by wrestlers. Mm. Um, sometimes I do it, uh, I do cartoon-related ones. Uh, but I really like to try and focus on the wrestling because I like to be able to, like, get the fans to see the bridge between makeup and wrestling. Because I don't think that many people talk really much about wrestling and makeup and how makeup has had a very heavy influence in the wrestling business. Um, and not just the women like Luna and Sensational Sherry, but then you had Legion of Doom, um, even The Undertaker with his guy liner, um, Stardust, Gold Dust. I mean, the list goes on and on with Umaga with his tribal face paint. Now, I've had people ask me to do that one, and that's kind of a slippery slope because, you know, those are, you know, cultural face markings and i don't want to seem like i'm culturally appropriating or mocking you know the samoan culture so that's kind of one of those looks that i probably won't ever do ever right and just mostly out of respect for the family yeah it it is cool though because like you are right like the the world of makeup whether you're a sting type demolition or you're even like darby allen right like currently or oscar right like mm -hmm all those makeups, like, they do give you a whole different character than what you would normally see, right? Like, <clears throat> I remember, like, when Impact was going on and Sting was there, right? Steve would be there without his makeup, and he's just like, talking, and you're like, oh, it's it's just Steve. And then as soon as he puts the makeup on, you're like, that's Sting right there. And, like, it's crazy to see the transformation. Even, like, uh, Finn Balor, <clears throat> you know, when he becomes Demon, or, you know, when he was Prince, Devitt, whatever you want to call him, all right? We know wrestling fans out there, you, you're paying attention. But, uh, it, it was just so cool to see like the changes, like it changes like the character, it changes the way like the person presents themselves. Like it's almost like you get this like freedom of like doing it. And I imagine it because like when I wear my mask out to the ring, like I come out very like 
it looks very hard, right? Because there's there's bullets, there's skulls, there's like, you know, spikes hanging out of them. And then I pull it down and I just look like this crazy person because I'm partly it's because I am. But nonetheless, like it's just going out there and just having fun and just like, and uh, you know, getting into like a whole different kind of mode and mindset. I have a question. I ask every person that comes on. So you were a worker and you just need to know what's the worst bump you've taken? Wow. Um, <laughs> I can't even say like it's really the worst bump, but the one bump I really hate taking are back body drops. And mainly because I never end up landing properly on my back. No matter how, I'm like, I'm a backwards cat. Basically, I don't land on my back like I'm supposed to for some reason. I don't know if it's, you know, just my body shape or whatever. But once I go over, like I go, I could go over perfectly. But then somehow midway through the landing, my body decides it doesn't know if the, you know, my shoulders want to hit the mat first or my butt wants to hit the mat first. And then sometimes I end up flare bumping it. So <laughs> <laughs> like, and the, like my whole right side ends up hitting the mat first. And I'm just like, what the hell? But yeah, the, the the worst bumps I I I could safely say are back body drops. Everything else, oh, I'm perfectly fine. I could do suplexes fine. Um, I surprisingly can do monkey flips fine. You know, hip tosses fine, but back body drops, no ma'am. <laughs> I won't lie, but somehow my trajectory always changes mid air. It's like it's weird. <laughs> I don't know why. And. And and it is a freaky bump to take. It's not something that you normally like. You're asked to do pretty much like a handstand on somebody while they like flip you over, and you're just like, "Nah, man. Either I'm gonna land this and run away, or this is just gonna be the like most painful thing I'm gonna go through." Yep. Yep. <laughs> I had a I had a friend tell me like, "Hey, take a take a uh, take a back by drop off this seven footer," and I was like, "Yeah, nope. no." And I ended up doing it, and it was. It was just as simple as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and the thing is, because, you know, you're midair and you're not seeing when you're going to hit the ground, you don't, like, for me, I try really hard to make sure that I have, like, enough air in my lungs that it doesn't knock the wind out of me. And it always does. Every time. I'm just like, <laughs> <gasps> and it, it sucks. But, you know, depending on who's giving me the back body drop, it'll always end up looking magical. You know what? Even though I, I, no matter how I land, it always hurts and it always sucks. But you know, if it's someone that I know and that I trust, they'll know how to get me up and over. Like I know how to post myself and everything. But still, like just the impact just never ever gets easier ever. So let's move over. Right after a show, we all have like those pre or those post match rituals that we like to have. So I'm kind of curious in the aspect of what's your post match ritual what's your post-match meal actually mcdonald's <laughs> anything in particular or is it just like i just need something off this menu actually i have to have a big mac after a show it has to like normally i order like the quarter pounder de uh deluxe meal but after a show it has to be a big mac it's just something about a big mac after a show in the middle of the night in the middle of god knows where and nice hot fries. Like I remember me and my husband did a show out in Williamsport and we uh, were on the way, there was a McDonald's on the way home. So we stopped at it and it took a little bit for us to get our food, but the food was nice and hot and fresh. And we like literally thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. So like our, our, our pre, our post-show ritual is definitely hitting up the local McDonald's because they're 24 seven and we're always hungry. Always. <laughs> so What's one of the hardest lessons that you've had to learn uh, being in the wrestling business? That what works for one person doesn't work for everybody else. And um, I literally almost kind of like quit the business because I was getting so, so much like, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. But it was just not working for me. And it was just like, it works for you, but it doesn't work for me and that's okay you know uh, a lot, especially these grizzled vets some of them they they they're just so 
hard up on their like habits and their their discipline that they don't seem to realize this is a whole new era of wrestling you know you don't have to train every single day in that ring once a week is perfectly fine especially if you know you're gonna be physically training and stuff like that you don't want to go too hard in the ring you just want to go enough where you have the muscle memory down that's it you don't have the, the whole you have to treat it as if you're in the middle of the no you don't okay no don't tell these newbies that because then they're gonna really go hard and then they're gonna retire early before they even have a chance to make it but um it was something that i had to learn on my own because <laughs> I eventually i had to just kind of drown everybody out right. and do what worked best for me and it's always it's always best to follow your own heart that's what i always tell people do what makes you happy do what makes you comfortable. Don't ever do something that doesn't make you comfortable. And if it does, you say something. I like that. I like that a lot. I know, like, uh, I was kind of nervous about some things that were, like, happening in a show, and I kind of, like, asked questions. <laughs> and if you were like, well, if you don't want to do that, then we don't have to do that. I was like, it's not that. It's like, walk me through the process of what we're talking about, and then maybe things will, like, change. But I was definitely yeah. kind of nervous at first. And then, you know, we did and we talked through everything and i was like hey let's get this done <laughs> so mm -hmm. sometimes like it's just like if you if you talk somebody through a process like it's cool but if you're being told like hey i'm gonna hit you with this move that you've never taken before yeah you definitely have to be like hey yo like uh i don't know what that's like so we we gotta talk about this real quick <laughs> yeah also another thing i feel like is important yeah. don't always take at face value the fact that someone says they've had a certain amount of time in the ring because a lot of people will lie about this and this happened to my husband uh this guy said oh yeah i've been training for six years and then nearly dropped my husband on his head and then we found out later on they, they were like the guy only had like one year tra training he has like barely a year under his belt and my husband was livid he was completely livid because you know he's broken his back before he's this man has gone through so many injuries and yet still gets in the ring anyways. So, yeah. It's crazy. So, it what kind of advice would you give to up and coming wrestlers? Definitely do what works for you and what makes you comfortable and always be honest about what you're willing to take and not take in a match. Because someone might say, oh, you know, I've done this move tons of times and you find out that's the first time they've ever done it. You don't want to get hurt. And, you know, you don't want to find yourself getting, you don't want them to botch and then you end up being the one getting injured. Because, again, like I said, uh, happened to my husband and it was definitely a very scary situation. But um, I think also another thing is don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. Um a lot of people in the business get scared about standing up for themselves and then a lot of bad habits continue to perpetuate in the ring when it comes to some of these vets who feel like oh you have to shake my hand or you have to shake everybody's hand we're in a pandemic sweetheart no we don't no we don't i personally feel like respect is earned not given and a lot of vets in the ring that I've had to share locker rooms with, unfortunately, I've never shaken their hand and they've never said anything to me. And I'd like to keep it that way, you know, not to be, you know, purposely disrespectful, but to let you know, you haven't done anything to earn my respect. I don't care how long you've been in the ring. I don't care how long you've walked this planet, but if you're not a nice person, I'm not going to treat you like a nice person. It's all about reciprocity. If you treat me nice and treat me with respect, I'm going to extend the same courtesy. And I feel like too many of these these um, up and coming wrestlers are being drilled to the fact that they're being forced to respect people that shouldn't be respected. They shouldn't even be booked, honestly, in this business. But I digress. It is what it is. Um, but I feel that you should you shouldn't be forced to have to show respect to somebody that you don't know. You know that's like parents trying to introduce you to that weird uncle. And it's like, you don't get good vibes out of them. Why in the world are you making me hug, hug this person or be near this person? Like, you know, <laughs> like to me, the grizzled vets, uh, these grizzled vets are like the weird uncle that, you know, there's something wrong with that one. There's a reason why you don't keep the kids around them. There's a reason why you don't keep them alone with the kids, you know? 
Yeah. But and and now an another thing, don't ever feel pressured to have legit ring gear. Some of the best guys in the ring wore jeans. John Cena, yeah. jorts. He started wearing he was wearing Echo jorts. You know, like legit Echo Unlimited. <laughs> you know, you saw the big rhino on his pockets. So, you know, one thing a lot of, um, I used to get my, uh, make, made fun of about it because, you know, I was broke in the business. You know, I couldn't exactly afford to have someone make me gear. Um, so, I, you know, if, if you're starting out in the business and you can't afford gear, that's fine. That's fine. Most of the gear that half these wrestlers wear are made by someone anyways. It's not like you could buy this in a store. At, at like your local high spots or anything like that um but sometimes you could just kind of makeshift gear by getting stuff on amazon i mean honestly it's really not that hard to like just kind of i mean it's how people cosplay they just buy something that they see on amazon and then they just kind of you know frankenstein it up and a lot of my gear was all like frankenstein gear that i got from like you know one store and then another store so gear does gear doesn't make the wrestler i can safely tell you that um, I know a kid who like dished out over three hundred dollars worth of gear. He couldn't even do like a fireman's carry. He couldn't take a fireman's carry. He couldn't this take a clothesline. Like couldn't bomb properly. And yeah, I never thought his his career was very short lived because of it. And I don't want people to feel pressure to like immediately like invest in gear. There's there's no need. No need. Some of the best wrestlers came out in some hand-me-downs and some jeans Zero. and stuff like that. Yeah. It's it's about how you are in the ring before how you look good in the ring, you know? Because yeah. someone could wrestle great in a burlap sack, and then nobody's going to notice that they're wearing that burlap sack. They're just like, whoa, that, that person can wrestle. They can wrestle. <laughs> I definitely, I agree. I uh, I know that a lot of my gear, like I do have my own gear that I had made, right? It cost me a pretty penny. Uh, but the rest of my gear is actually makeshift. Like I found a pair of gloves for like 24 bucks that I wanted to buy. Then I, I bought them. I bought my vest for like 24 bucks because I was like, yo, this is on Amazon. Let me grab this yeah. one. My hat like is probably... Next to my pants, my hat is probably the most expensive thing I bought. <laughs> like, yeah, I was like, yeah, it, it's from Lids, and I paid, I paid for what I wanted, and you know, I, yeah, I think about that a lot. Like, you don't year. have to force yourself. Yeah, in the first year in the business, you're you're really gonna be like, you know, stretching yeah. yourself thin financially between shows because you know it's always a hot dog and a handshake. Always, you gotta pay those dues. <laughs> so, you know. Make sure that, like, I, I look at it this way. Focus more on being a great wrestler than looking like a great wrestler. I like Everything it. else will fall into place. <laughs> and that's just great advice for people who are up and coming as a wrestler, too. Like, mm -hmm. hey, yo, just focus on wrestling, and then the rest of the chips will fall into place. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, um, it's almost like a domino effect. Like, if you're really good in the <laughs> ring... Promoters are going to want to book you and actually pay you. And then once you start making money, then you can actually invest in, um, you know, nice gear. Because then eventually they're going to say, listen, I want to book you. I want to pay you more. You know, maybe you should invest in gear. And then you could start investing in gear. You know, when you know that you're really going to get those bookings, you're really going to make that money. Because that's what happened to me eventually. Like when I first started, it was just, you know, makeshift clothes. And then eventually I started getting paid. I started getting bookings. And then I could finally afford actual gear. So, you know, it's a, it's a baby step process. Facts. Yeah. <laughs> well, seeing that you've been kind of around for a while and you've been traveling sure. and stuff, I just need <laughs> one do and yeah. one don't of the locker room. This, oh man, like I don't even know how to answer this question. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Repeat the question. Hold on, because I'm, 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 I gotta, I gotta think here. Yeah, no problem. So you've been around. You've kind of traveled from place to place. You've been in, in a lot of different locker rooms, and I just need to know one do and one don't of the locker room. 
do show up on time. I cannot stress this enough. Um, if you know you're not going to show up on time, I mean, I get it, traffic and stuff like that. But if you're like one of the main event matches or a very important like player in the game, like me, I'm ring announcer. So I have to be there early because I have to know who's going to be on the card. I have to make sure I have all my cards ready to be able to announce everybody. And also the fact that because I am the media coordinator for TikTok, I also have to film promos and stuff. So I feel like be either on time or be early. I say be early. Um, and I get it. Like life happens and stuff like that. But, you know, once you get there, it, it does become a bit of a, a mess because then you don't have time to like speak to the promoter. And then you're rushing through your match with your opponent and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's one of the more important things. I feel like just be there on time. And one of the things, and this is my pet peeve personally, um, if you have to put the ring together, help out and put the ring together because you want to make sure that that ring is sturdy enough that nothing happens. Like me personally, I, if I have to help out with the ring, I will because if I'm getting in that ring and something happens, then at least I hold myself accountable. Um, but if something happens and it's because of someone else, then they have to deal with the burden. And it's because they didn't do their job well. So I feel like don't half-ass putting the ring together, please. That's one thing I will always say. You know, be on time, but do not be lazy putting that ring together because, I mean, there was one time I had a match with uh, Jamie Senegal and one of the planks busted in like right before we got into the ring, like it busted during one of the other matches. So me and Jamie had to pretty much work ourselves around the one part of the ring that was like sticking up. So, um, yeah, I, I, I say don't, don't half ass putting the ring together, like put that ring together and, and, just you know lend because the, the more people that help out with the ring the faster the show goes the faster everybody can go home because i've seen that i've seen like times where there's like two or three guys putting the ring together and it takes forever but then there's times where it's like 10 20 people are putting the ring together and that thing is put together in like 15 20 minutes because there's 15 people placing everything together and bam puzzle piece real quick and I remember doing it with Matt Stryker one time. It was for a show where me and my husband won the tag belts. And the ring showed up a little late. And we all basically just grabbed the plank of wood. We all grabbed the ring post. We all grabbed the piece of something. And we had that ring put together in 15 minutes. So. Yes. Many, high, like, many and hands it's not even make light work. Huh? Yeah, I was like, many hands make light work. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. Definitely, definitely don't just sit on the corner. I don't care how long you've been in the business. Like, Charles Robinson still helps set up the ring and sweeps, and he's the ref that's been around for the longest. Yes. And if that man can help put the ring together, you can too. <laughs> well, those are all my heavy-hitting questions, but we do got to get into the second-best segment of this podcast, and people are trying to figure out what the first is. It's the Red Dogs Power Rankings that you can find on our debate shows every Sunday. Cheap plug. This is what it is. But this is the three-count podcast, ten-count questions. And, Lexa, this is how it works. I'm going to fire off ten questions at you rapid fast. And whatever's your answer, that's your answer. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready, Freddy. <laughs> so we're going to put the imaginary timer on for ad pressure. Bing. And here we go. SmackDown or Raw? Raw. Favorite movie? Tu Wong Fu, thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. Filmed in Nebraska. Fun fact for those, because, you know, this kid is from Nebraska. So let's talk about that. <laughs> so, Sonic or Mario? Sonic. Uh, favorite color? Green. PlayStation or Xbox? Xbox. Favorite Funko Pop figure? Buttercup, which is <laughs> somewhere right here. <laughs> I was like, I see them all back there. I was like, I'm picking this question. Uh, it's a Friday night. What are you? What are you doing? 
editing videos, enjoying some whiskey, and watching my husband game or stream <laughs> while he's gaming. Favorite podcast? The Three Count Podcast. Yeah, it's not like we have to <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, nominate one person that you want to see on this podcast. I would love to see Nyla Rose. She is so much fun. Definitely. Would, you would definitely have so much fun with her. I would love to see Nyla on this show. Not like I've, I've reached out a few times to try to book her. <laughs> um, last but not least, my favorite question to ask every single person who comes on this show. <laughs> Favorite curse word? <laughs> Why am I thinking of the TikTok? <laughs> no, but it's definitely not um, the F word. No, it's definitely shit. Because I always say it in such a weird way sometimes. Because I'll, it's such, it's to me, it's more versatile than fuck. Everybody uses it. But I like shit. Shit. <laughs> Right. Well, those are all my heavy, all my questions that I have for you. So the last thing I just need from you is to let our listeners and our viewers know where they can find you. Um, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, you can look up either Wrestling with Beauty or you could just look me up Lexa Rose. Uh, you could find me on TikTok, Obi Woom Kenobi. You know me, the one and only Kenobi. Uh, Twitter, I am the Ring Queen Lexa on Twitter and Instagram. And yeah, that's pretty much about it. I mean, hey. I got all bases covered. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. You have got everything that she wanted to give you. You have all of her handles. You guys can go look her up. You guys can check out her YouTube channel, you know. But like every great part of a wrestling match, we got to take it home. Because this is the Three Count Podcast presents Now in the Ring. And I'm your host, Clifford Red Dog Miller, the man that leads you up this mountain called wrestling. But like every good Sherpa, which I'd like to think I am, you got to have someone who's been there, done that, and can do it more efficiently. And you can. That's why it's never about me. It's about who's entering. You see her right there, right next to me. The ring queen herself, Lex Rose. You guys know what to do. Tune in to the next episode and be there. Or you just wait for the episode to end. You wait for that outro. And then you choose another episode to listen oh. to. What's going on, Three Count Nation? I'm Clifford Red Talk Miller with the catchphrase. But what I really want to do right now, go to twitter.com, right? Go over there, find us at the Three Count underscore pod, give us a follow, give us a like, give us a comment. We want to talk to you guys. Go to IG at the Three Count Pod, give us a like, give us a follow, leave us a comment. We want to interact with you. Go to youtube.com, give us a subscribe, turn the bell on, turn on notifications, leave a comment. We want to talk to you. Go to anger.fm forward slash the three count podcast. And in there, you can leave us a message and we will talk to you. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that we want to talk to you. We want to have fun with you guys and we love listening to what you guys have to say. Also, one thing I need you to do for me, the three count podcast also has merchandise. Oh, at prowrestlingtees.com forward slash the three count pod. Please go buy our t-shirts. We love you guys and we hope you love us too. So. Show us some support, please.